me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18 beginning. That's the passage that Brother Todd read for us just a moment ago. When Todd called me yesterday and asked me if I could fill in, I told him uh, that I could either give him a good sermon or a fast sermon, and he picked a fast sermon. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning in verse 18. It says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, whether or not this, this passage specifically applies to us generally or, or just the apostles, the principle, I think, most certainly applies to us specifically. It's the principle that as children of God, as God's children, we ought to want the same things that he wants. And he most certainly wants the lost to be saved. He is long-suffering, not, wanting that, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so our goal should be his goal, and our goal should be to reconcile the world to Christ. We are to be ambassadors for Christ. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We have been committed the word of reconciliation. Well, unfortunately, at least for me, that is easier said than done. I'm good at uh, some things, but I'm ashamed to admit that sharing the gospel on a personal, individual level is not one of those things. In fact, I'd probably say that it's easier for me to stand up here in front of all of you on a Sunday morning than it is for me to sit down one-on-one with a coworker, or a friend or a family member or a neighbor and tell them the reason for the hope that is within me. And I'd expect that probably some of you here this morning share in that struggle. In fact, if I asked you to think about it, we could probably all come up with someone in particular that we know we need to share the gospel with. Maybe we see them every single day. It's a coworker, it's a relative, it's a friend. And for some reason, we have not told them what they need to hear. Why do we avoid sharing the gospel? Why is it so hard for us to tell people about the thing that we think is most important to us in this world? We cannot tell them anything more important. We cannot share with them anything more valuable. And it is so hard for us to tell them. Why is it so hard for us to tell them? You know, I I think one of the main reasons uh, that it's so hard for us to tell people about the gospel, about the good news of Christ, why it's so hard for us to redeem the time we have with the lost, is because we come up with excuses that we think are pretty good. We think they're legitimate. I'm pretty good at that. That's kind of my job, in a way, is to come up with excuses and justifications and legitimize things. Uh, And so I'm one of the biggest offenders. They sound good to us. Our excuses sound good to us. And you know, in the brief conversations I've had with people who struggle with this also, what I've come to realize is that most of us have the exact same excuses. We might package them a little bit differently. They might look differently uh, on the outside. But when you boil it down, you get down to the component parts, we're mostly making the same excuses. And what I've come to realize is that our excuses are not different than the excuses that were used thousands of years ago. If you will, turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, we're going to look uh, just very briefly at the story of Moses and the burning bush. It's a story we know well. And I want to suggest to you that in some way, Moses was the very first ambassador for God. Just like us, we're to be ambassadors for Christ. Moses, in some way, was the very first ambassador for God. I won't read uh, the first ten verses of of Exodus chapter 3. 
Uh, but I'm going to summarize them. Moses is, is in the desert. He is a shepherd. And a sheep goes astray. And so Moses follows this sheep to the Mount Horeb. And he comes across the burning bush. And it is God speaking through the burning bush to Moses. And what God tells him is he says, Moses, I have seen the affliction of my people. They are mistreated. They are abused. And I want you, Moses, I want you to help me save my people. I want you to help me save my people. I want to start a new relationship with my people, and I want to take them to a promised land. Now, does that sound similar to what we're entrusted with in this ministry of reconciliation? God has, has just like he told Moses, I want you to, to free my people from slavery, so also we are helping God free people from slavery to sin. John chapter 8 and verse 34 says, those who commit sin are slaves to sin. God wants Moses to help him establish a new relationship with his people. And likewise, Romans chapter 6 tells us that when we are freed from our slavery to sin, we become slaves to righteousness. We have a new relationship, a new master. And of course, Moses, his task is to bring them to a promised land. And we too have been asked to help God secure his lost children so that they can be with him in eternity. And so in a very real sense, Moses has been asked to do exactly what we're asked to do. And just like us, Moses has excuses. Moses has what I see are, are four excuses as to why he's just not the guy for the job. And I want us to consider whether his excuses have merit in God's eyes. Because I think we recycle the same excuses. And so maybe if we can appreciate God's view of the excuses Moses uses, we can start to learn and, and appreciate why our excuses fall a little bit flat. Let's pick up in verse 11 with his first excuse. God has come to Moses and he says, Moses, I've chosen you. I want you to help me bring my people out of slavery into a promised land. Moses responds in verse 11. It says, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses is essentially saying, look, God, I don't have the credentials for this. My resume isn't what it should be. This is going to be a big mismatch. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I've been in the desert for 40 years chasing sheep, and you're talking about Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the known world. You want me to go to him. I'm not the guy for the job. In fact, the people you want me to convince to follow me, they know my past. And I was with the Egyptians. They're going to think I'm a hypocrite. The moment I go and I say, hey, guys, you need to follow me, they're going to throw it in my face. They're going to say, you were one of them. And so, God, really, uh, if you want somebody, it's not me. I'm just not the guy for the job. Do we do that sometimes? Do we say, look, I, I can't talk to my boss because they're my boss? Or I can't talk to a grandparent because I'm, I'm a kid? Uh, or I can't have this conversation with this person because they're too powerful or they hold too much influence? Or I've got them on a pedestal, and so I just don't have the credentials. We need someone else. Uh, surely someone else will take care of it. Let's look at God's response to Moses. I think it's the same response he would give to us. In verse 12, it says, So he said, God speaking, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God tells Moses, he says, Moses, it's not about who you are. It's not about who you are. It's about who I am, and I will be with you. That's the same thing that he would tell us. It is not about who you are. It's not about who I am. It's about who God is, and God will be with us. Well, Moses is not convinced. He has another excuse. In verse 13, we see a second excuse. It says, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Okay, this is a bit disingenuous because in chapter 3, verse 6, which we skipped over, God already tells him who he is. 
He says, moreover, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Moses already knew who he was, and he was scared. He was fearful because he knew who he was. And so this, this excuse uh, is, is just kind of a facade for him saying, look, eventually they're going to ask me a question I don't know the answer to. And so I don't have enough information. You might want somebody else because I don't know enough. And surely, eventually, what's going to happen is my lack of knowledge is going to be manifest, and this is going to fail. And so you want to get someone who knows more. Do we do that too? Do we say, I, I'll, I'll talk to somebody who really needs to hear it? It's the most important thing I could ever tell them, but uh, I just I need to study more. And uh, a couple years from now, that's when I'll get around to it. And, um, or, or Jacob, Jacob would be better at that, uh, or Zach would be better at that, uh, or Gavin. Zach, uh, we have so many Zachs that uh, <laughs> Gavin feels like a Zach to me. But um, we do that, don't we? It's somebody else's job. Somebody knows more. There's always someone more expert. And so on that basis alone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deflect. Let's look at God's response. In verse 14, it says, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. God's response is, Moses, I will give you the answer. I will give you the information you need. That's the same response that he's given to us. 1 Peter chapter 3, or chapter 1 and verse 3 says that we have all things pertaining to life and godliness. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have all we need. We have all the answers. We have the answer book. The cheat sheet. We have it in front of us at our disposals. We have it on our phones. We have it in paper. We have the answers. And what God also does is later in uh, chapter 3, he gives Moses some expectations. He qualifies his expectations so that Moses isn't uh, shocked when he fails because Moses is going to fail. He's going to fail more than once. And God tells him, that's going to happen, and it's okay, but ultimately, if you do what I ask you to do, things are going to work out the way I want them to work out. And God has given us those expectations, too. We're not always going to succeed, but our job is to plant and to water, and God gives the increase. God does the heavy lifting. He has done the heavy lifting with his son. We got the easy part. And we have all the answers we need. Okay, well, Moses is still not convinced. And so in chapter 4, verse 1, he gives his third excuse. It says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Now, I can sympathize with Moses on this one. Think about his situation. He has been gone for 40 years. So he's going to show up. He's going to say, Hey, guys, I'm still here. Uh... I've been in the desert for 40 years. I became a shepherd. Uh, and while I was doing that, I went into a mountain and a burning bush that wasn't burning uh, talked to me and told me that I need to come and uh, free you from your oppressors. That's a tough sell. That really is a tough sell. And so he's concerned, what if they don't believe me? Do we do the same thing? Do we say, look, it's going to be a hard sell. I, I've got to convince him that Jesus uh, was God, fully God and fully man, that he came to earth, he emptied himself, 
that he died, but he's still alive, that he had all this power, but his creation killed him. I just don't think that I can sell this. Uh, somebody else could do better. I'm, they may not believe me. I may not be persuasive enough. What God tells him, and we won't read it in the next uh, verses 2 through, through 9, is I'm going to give you all the proof that you need. I'm going to give you all the evidence you need. You can throw your stick down, and it will turn into a snake. You can put your hand in your coat, and it will become leprous. You can pour water on the bank of the Nile, and it will become blood. I will provide you with evidence, Moses. And he has told us the same thing. In Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, we are told that, that his creation itself evidences his existence. So that we are without excuse. There is plenty of evidence. We have eyewitness accounts who have seen the things that happened and have recorded it for us. History supports us. There are evidences abundant. Let me tell you something. If someone is not going to believe you in your sharing of the gospel, and that's probably going to happen. It will happen, in fact. It will not be because you lack evidence. God has made sure of that. Okay, well, Moses still is not convinced, and he gives one final excuse. In chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I think Moses is hes a little bit frustrated, and so he says, God, I'm telling you, I'm not the guy for the job. I am not a good speaker. I think it's funny he says that because in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, we see that he was mighty in words and wisdom. But he says, God, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good speaker. You really don't want me. You don't know me like I know me. I will mess this up. Do we do that sometimes? Do we say, look, when it comes down to it, okay, maybe... Maybe you will give me the answers. Maybe you will be with me. Maybe you will provide me with evidences. But I'm really just not the guy for the job or not the girl for the job. I just think somebody else will be better. I love God's response. It's one of my favorite uh, verses in the whole Bible. In chapter 4, verse 11, this is God's response. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute? the deaf, the seen, or the blind, have not I the Lord. Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Who made man's mouth? God tells Moses, I am the author of communication. I am the author of communication. And you know what, Moses? I chose you. I know you. I know your flaws, and I choose you. He knows us, he knows our flaws, and he has chosen us to reconcile the world to him. That's an incredible thing. He chooses to use broken vessels to save his children. He could snap his finger, and whatever he wants done could be done, but he chooses to use us. He knows us. He made us, and he wants us to help him. That's amazing. And you know, we don't have to help his word out. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, tells us that he was not eloquent of speech. He did not come with persuasive words. He determined to know nothing but Christ crucified to the church at Corinth. And he did that so that God's word could be magnified above all else. That you could not attribute what was happening to any man's ability it's the word of God. God made man's mouth. He made us, and he chose us. 
Well, as we know, the story goes, Moses did ultimately go to Pharaoh, and he failed ten times before he was finally successful. We also know that he ultimately got his brother Aaron to help him out. And I think that's our final lesson for us this morning is if you truly feel like you can't do it alone, if you really feel that way, God has given us a great family right here where you can get your brother or your sister to go with you and to help you. Do not let your insecurities or your, your, your excuses prevent you from redeeming the time you have with the lost. Let me recap really quick. It's not about who you are. It's about who God is. God has given you all the information you need. He has given you all the evidence you need. And God knows you. He made you. And he wants to use you. Thank you so much for your attention. I've gone a little bit over. Uh, but I think uh, it was better than I expected. <laughs> if there's anyone here this morning who uh, needs to respond to the gospel, who has heard that message of reconciliation and who wants to be reconciled to God their Father. There is no better time than right now to come forward, to put on Christ in baptism, to be buried with him, and to be raised to walk in newness of life. If there is anything we can do for you, please come forward as we stand and sing.